Strategic Living with Brian Holmes, episode number 12. Welcome to the program today, everyone. My name is Brian Holmes, and this is the Strategic Living Podcast, where we are all about transforming minds, developing leaders, and changing nations. Well, that's a real big, noble task. Well, we believe with all of our hearts that if you and I are healed and our minds are transformed and we are equipped and really understand who we are, we can truly change nations. It's great to have you with us today. I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about, challenging the status quo. We're going to be dealing with seven steps to a transformed mind. Well, let's get ready, everybody. Let's get started. Well, it's a real joy to have you on the program with us again today, and we trust that you have had a great week since the last time we visited. And uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago on this episode, we're going to be talking about one of my passions, one of my favorite subjects, and that is challenging the status quo. And specifically, we're going to deal with seven steps to a transformed mind. But let me just kind of lay the foundation this way so you'll understand why I'm so passionate about this subject. The truth is, is that I'm really juiced about talking about the mind of man. You see, how I think determines my success or my failure. What I believe to be true about me governs and regulates the course and the trajectory of my life. The mindsets that I hold truly govern the outcomes that I experience in my life. My belief systems regulate my efficacy and my progress in every single area of my life. And here's where I get really excited. You see, religion has taught us that being saved is really the, the whole picture. And I'm going to tell you right up front that I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. I believe that every human being ever born to time should have and can have a relationship with him. He is the gateway into the kingdom of God. And I believe with all of my heart that every man should be saved according to the gospel, according to what we see in Scripture. I believe that. But I would argue today that there are millions upon millions of born-again Christians who are sitting on church pews who are not living to the potential for which they were created. Their minds have not been transformed. Yes, their spirit has been renewed and regenerated and redeemed, but their thinking has not changed, and it is their thinking that has regulated them to their present state in life. The Bible tells us that we are not to be conformed to the image and the thinking that is in this world. And I like to put it like this. Do not be conned into a form. (laughs) Don't be forced into a shape or a mold that someone else dictates to you. But rather, it says, be transformed. And how is one transformed? Well, one is transformed by the renewing of their mind. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is the mind. It is the mind. It is the mind. So today on this program, I'm going to be sharing with you several things, but one of them is really a key that I believe is paramount to us rising above average, coming up above the fray, being in that top one, that top 2% of, of influencers and kingdom-minded believers in the earth. And I believe the key is your mind and what you believe to be true. That's right, the mind of man. What is it about the mind of man that we need to understand so that we too can truly rise to the potential that God created us to be?
That's what we're talking about today. And I want to share with you a very familiar scripture or proverb that no doubt you've heard in your lifetime. Give you just a snippet of it. But it's from the the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse number 7. And it says, As a man thinks within himself, so is he. As a man thinks within himself, so is he. There are numerous other translations that we can look to. I know the original King James Version of the Bible says, As a man thinketh within his heart, so is he. Well, let's just put the principle like this. What it really means is is that whatever you believe to be true, this is the direction and the course your life will take. You will become the thing you believe to be true. It has been said that whatever the mind of man can conceive or believe, it can achieve. It can be created or realized. It's because God created us to have creative powers, and it is out of the the spirit of man and the mind of man that these things come to be. There is so much science and documentation that shows that when a person genuinely believes something, they literally see what they believe in spite of what the truth may be. This is called perception. And we know that God created us in his image, in his likeness, after the exact pattern of his own structure, of his own makeup. And we also know that in the New Testament, in Paul's writings, Paul talked much about putting on the mind of Christ. In other words, it stands to reason that Jesus Christ never really doubted who he was, He was very clear on his relationship to the Father and what he carried and what he was there to do. We look at examples such as in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1 where God comes to Jerry, as I like to call him, and says, look, before you were even conceived, I knew you. Before you were born, I had set you apart for a particular purpose. And oh, by the way, I've already given you an appointment for that moment in which you will intersect that which you were created to do. And when you get there, I've already put my words in your mouth and everything you need to be what I have already called you to be, you will be that. And you know the story, Jeremiah began to argue with the creator. Can you imagine the creation arguing with the creator, the one who's already woven into your very essence, who you are, what you are, what your potential is, what your gifts are, what your personality is, what you are called to accomplish, and we are arguing with the one who actually made us. That's what Jeremiah did. It's amazing to me how the knowledge of God, that is what he knows to be true about us, many times is not at all what we believe to be true about ourselves. So the knowledge we possess is contained or housed in the mind of man. It's in the brain, if you will, but it's in the soul, in the mind of man. And Remembering that we are patterned after God's image, remember this, it is out of his mind, his thoughts, his imagination, that he called things into being that did not even previously exist. That's right. Light did not exist, and in his mind, he thought a thought, and then out of his thought, he spoke the word, and out of the word, that which did not exist literally manifest came into being. That's the power of the mind. God thought a thought. He had an idea. He spoke his thought, and out of thought was created what became reality in a natural dimension. The creator created out of the capacity and out of the imagination of his mind, out of the image he had formed in his mind concerning something, whatever the thing was. So his mind conceived the idea, his word spoke the idea, and what the mind of God And what his word projected became, and it was so. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It stands to reason that God, when he created you and I, he had in his mind an image, a likeness, a picture. He had in his mind a plan. The Bible tells us that he he knows the plans he has for us. 
Matter of fact, he made man, as we've already established, after his exact pattern. We know that God is a spirit. Well, we also know that man is a spirit. We have a flesh body, but we are a spirit being having a temporary earthly experience. We know if we're made in his image and after his pattern that we should possess many of the same characteristics and powers he does. Well, God possesses creative powers. Therefore, man possesses creative powers. God gave man a mind. Think about this now. God gave man the capacity and the the mechanism to be able to think, to process thoughts, to rationalize, to work, to cultivate thoughts. And he created within each of us the power to imagine or dream a thing. I believe dreams are critical to our existence a person without a vision for their life, you're dying on the vine. But God gave us the power to create and the power to produce in time and space the thoughts and ideas conjured and fostered in our minds. You see, the human mind has the capacity to literally change the world. It is only when that which is held in our mind does not meet our potential that we limit ourselves We limit ourselves to a life that is less than what God really intended for us. Here's the thing. We are not waiting on God to do anything for us. God is literally calling us to move into agreement with what he knows to be true about us because when we believe what he believes and what he knows, what is in us will manifest. It will happen. It is a a byproduct of simple alignment. The mind, the thoughts, the beliefs that we hold in our mind literally govern our ability to produce God-sized results. So it's what our heart believes that determines the direction and outcome of our life and situation. What do you mean it's what the heart believes? Well, there's this interesting scripture that I always reference, and, and everyone in the church world, the religious world, loves to profess this scripture. It says... If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then anything you put your hand to, whatever you put your mind to, it's going to happen. And and we have a lot of people running around, even in the secular setting, professing affirmations, confessions, I am statements, which I'm a very big believer in all of those things. But they're saying the words, but they do not agree or believe in their heart what they are saying. And the thing about that scripture is whatever you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Many times we are saying things out of a place of hope and desperation, but we do not believe at a root level what we are saying. Therefore, what we are saying really carries no weight. We actually move toward our current most dominant picture In other words, how you see yourself and how you see your future right now, what your mind believes about your future, you are moving toward that picture right now. So the image or the belief that you hold in your mind concerning anything, any area of life, will literally produce an outcome that resembles exactly what your mind is believing about that future. So if the image or belief that you hold is not what God knows about you or about that situation, then ultimately we will produce less than what God intended and designed. You see, there is always a thought, there's always a picture or an, an image, there's always an idea that is working to elevate itself in your mind's eye. There's always something competing for your belief, for your attention, for you to be locked in on it. And when you get locked in on a lesser belief, a subpar belief, and any belief that is less than what God believes about a situation is a subpar belief. But when you get locked in on that image in your mind's eye, then you also lock yourself into the current position or situation that you were in. You can be standing in the middle of the most blessed life you can have all kinds of favor happening around you. You can have opportunities coming out of your ears. 
And yet, because of limiting beliefs, you can be completely immobilized and stuck, and you will be unable to to have access to the opportunities that are presenting themselves to you. So write this down. I have to change my thinking. I have to consciously go at erroneous limiting beliefs, and I have to literally work to see myself differently so that my future can look different. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, the significant problems we face cannot be solved on the same level we were when we created the problem. That's powerful. All that I am dealing with in my life right now, whatever lack, whatever uh, financial struggles, whatever business challenges, whatever relationship issues I may have right now, those issues or problems were created on a certain level of thinking. And if I'm going to solve those issues, move beyond that, go into another season or into another level, having really benefited from the process, then I can only solve those issues thinking differently than when I created the problem. It's the mind of man that literally limits God in the earth. See, I'm a believer in what is called the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not where you're going when you die. The kingdom of God is something that he intends to establish here. In other words, you and I, as his sons, his daughters in the earth, his children, his offspring, his heir in the earth, we are here to establish his will, his plans, his kingdom in the earth and realm. And the only reason his kingdom is not showing up the way it could right now is because we have a lot of people who are not thinking as they should think. They believe things that are lies, that are less than truth. And we know, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We are what we think. And we become what we continue to think. I'm going to say that again. We are what we think, and we become what we continue to think. If you are not seeing progress, if you feel stuck right now, I have a simple solution for you. You need to really aggressively evaluate what are the recurring thoughts in my mind? What am I focused on? What regurgitated thinking am I processing? Because it is your thinking that is keeping you where you are. There's a scripture that I I often refer to in talking about the mind where we are instructed to gird up the loins of our mind. I always found that to be fascinating. I Matter of fact, it was something we sort of chuckled about as kids. Uh, I mean, you know, God talking about loins. But here we are, and, and we're being instructed, maybe even commanded, to gird up the loins. It's a word picture. Gird up the loins of your mind. Why do we gird up the loins of our mind? Well, the, the word picture conjures up the idea of the reproductive organs, both male and female, the loin region of the male body, the, the female anatomy, both speaks to the reproductive system. So he is saying you need to get control of these thoughts that continue to reproduce themselves. You see, if you don't arrest an erroneous limiting belief or thought, that thought will create another thought that will create another thought that will create another thought. And before you know it, you're not dealing with one. You're dealing with a plethora of of thoughts that are barraging your mind robbing you of your hope, robbing you of that thing that that builds your faith and your confidence about your future, and you you just are paralyzed. So we must gird up. We must take control of our thinking. Miles Monroe, who I happen to enjoy his teaching and his reading, there's a few things that he said about thoughts. He said, there's nothing more powerful than a thought or an idea. However, There is nothing more important than the source of our thoughts. He goes on to say that our thoughts are the products of what we have heard or what we have learned. And how we deal with information or how we process things in life is a result of what we believe. Every new opportunity is filtered through what we believe to be true or what we believe to be possible. So how we process things in life. 
is a result of our thinking and our, how we process ideas. So you say, what is this process of thought, Brian? Well, let me just give you a couple of things to consider here. The process of thought to me looks like this. Number one, a source, whether it's good or bad, transmits its ideas through words and pictures. These words and pictures or images transmit thoughts and ideas into our mind. That's how we receive information, through words and through pictures. And these thoughts, being like seed, when conceived, these thoughts become ideas. Ideas, once they're conceived, become ideologies. Ideologies become beliefs. Watch this now. Beliefs, when they are fully processed and fully assimilated, become convictions or mindsets. These are places where we are strongly persuaded about something. We are deeply convinced it is the concretization of a belief. And once these convictions are conceived, convictions, these deep-seated belief systems, become philosophies of life. Philosophies conceived become lifestyles. And lifestyles, or how we go about living our life and processing relationships, processing opportunities, processing our business, Lifestyles literally determine the outcome of life and ultimately whether or not we fulfill our God-given destiny. And so how we live our life determines the outcome, but it goes all the way back to a moment when a thought or an idea was introduced through words or pictures. That's how thoughts are assimilated, and that is how they affect us. So when your philosophy of life, your beliefs, your thoughts, your convictions when those are all based in truth or based in how you were created by God to think, then you will naturally rule over your environment and you will fulfill the purposes of God in your life. Now, when these beliefs, philosophies, thoughts, convictions are based on erroneous thinking, on wrong attitudes, on toxic emotional places, and they're not pure in their essence, it will produce frustration, you will feel trapped, you will feel hopeless, and you will be living life standing back on your heels rather than leaning into life and moving ahead. One of the most awesome quotes I've ever heard was this. It says, we act in accordance with the truth as we believe it to be. We act in accordance with the truth as we believe it to be. Whether it's true or not, we literally act, we behave, we make decisions, we make choices in our life every moment, every day, based on what we believe to be true. And I want to just say to you right now, it's very possible. As a matter of fact, I would say it's probable that much of what you hold to be accurate and true about your person, about your potential, about your worth, about your value, about relationships, many of those things you believe to be true, and they are not true. Many of those things you believe to be true, but you learned those to be true through a process of, of hurts and the way you were taught, the examples you saw in your life, etc. And these become strongholds in your mind. Well, there are several kinds of mindsets, and I'm just going to breeze through this neighborhood quickly. There are social mindsets, how we look at social settings and social relationships, family mindsets. Every one of us have a particular way of thinking about how we engage with family. You know, uh, some people have a natural aversion, I should say an unnatural aversion to relationships with in-laws or siblings or step-parents or whatever the case may be. So we have, a, we have mindsets and beliefs about family, relationships, friendships, uh, you know, people who we submit ourselves to in authority. We have mindsets concerning economic and financial issues. You know, some of you listening to this podcast today, 
you you say with your mouth that you truly want to be wealthy and financially independent. Yet there are mindsets, there are things that you believe at a core level that you learned as a child about money that literally will not allow you to move into the very place that you have the potential of moving into. I mean, we, we can want something, truly want something, and as the closer we move toward it, the greater the battle internally becomes because we are working in conflict with what our heart believes to be true about something. And money happens to be one of those big issues. We have mindsets about religion, about church, about God. We have people who are defeatists or pessimists. That's their mindset. The glass is always half empty. Matter of fact, the glass is really always empty. We have people who have a victim mindset. People are always out to get them. Somebody's always out to destroy them, and it's always somebody else's fault. We have people that have mindsets of martyrdom. You know, they just, they're always the martyr. Every one of us listening to this podcast, me speaking right now, we all have trust and, and non-trust issues. <laughs> I should say trust issues. And there are so many things that we deal with, and we function second nature in our life, never thinking about, man, the fruit of my life is a reflection of what I believe. And if I'm constantly having relationship issues, I'm having struggles uh, connecting with close friends, it seems like I'm always sabotaging this situation or that situation. I'm telling you right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is because there is something deep in your heart that you believe to be true that probably came to be, quote unquote, true in your heart and mind based on something tragic or difficult you went through or something you saw modeled or heard taught. So what are the effects of these mindsets? Well, a negative mindset causes a perpetual posture of doubt. I want you to get this. Matter of fact, write this down. A negative mindset causes doubt. Doubt creates hesitation or paralysis. Given a great opportunity, that doubt causes you just to freeze. Hesitation leads to failure. Again, negative mindsets create a posture of doubt. Doubt creates hesitation. Hesitation always leads to failure. Because when you can't pull the trigger, you can't move into the next season. See, mindsets are what creates your expectations. If you believe that every person that you ever date or get close to, a member of the opposite sex in a romantic relationship is going to hurt you, I promise you, you will have self-fulfilling prospects prophecy showing up in your life every day. Every time you move into a relationship, something will happen because that is what your heart expects to happen. Your expectations are literally self-fulfilling prophecies. So what you expect you get, a mindset literally locks you into a realm, thereby limiting the results, the achievements, the accomplishments, the, the progress. Well, our mindsets are developed throughout our lives. And again, words, pictures, experiences, all these things create these beliefs. Our mindsets, if not aligned with what God knows, causes a deficit, or I will call it a liability. A liability is really a compound word that's limit ability. So it limits my ability, my performance. It limits the outcomes. The very thing that I want the most, I can't seem to get my hands on it because my mind keeps playing tricks on me and disallowing me to grab a hold of the opportunities. Whereas a godly mindset actually empowers, engages, it activates my full potential, and I naturally move into what it is that I am supposed to be moving into. Again, our friend Albert Einstein said, the world we have created is a product of our thinking it cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So let's get to it. The title of this episode is Challenging the Status Quo. So what is the status quo? Well, Webster defines it as the existing state of affairs, normalcy. What's normal to you? It is the state or fact of simply being normal. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to be normal. It is a compliment when somebody says to me, you're just not normal. 
my immediate response is, thank you very much. Because there is nothing about normal or status quo or average that I want to be. The status quo, then, is that which has become normal to you. See, what is normal to you may not at all be normal. Did you hear what I said? What is normal to you, you've accepted it as being, well, this is just where I am. This is how I'm going to live my life. This is pretty much what I can expect. And you have framed that as being normal. But ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) there is always a better place. There's always a greater result. There's always more that you have the potential to grab a hold of in your life. So normal is not necessarily normal. The status quo then is the standard or the pattern to which you and I have been conformed. It's, it's what has become average. And by the way, whatever we consider to be normal is where we work so hard in our minds to keep things the way they are. Because in order for if we go above normal or below normal, we experience what is called insanity. So the mind works very powerfully to regulate and to govern and keep you within the confines of what we oftentimes refer to as a comfort zone. That's where it's normal. Let's look at it another way. Thoughts form beliefs. Beliefs form our mindsets. Our mindsets set us on a particular trajectory. And that trajectory produces certain results or outcomes. The outcomes, watch this now. So here we are. The, the thoughts form beliefs, beliefs are mindsets. Our mindsets now set us on a course. And then that course is going to take us somewhere where we experience a certain measure or level of results or outcomes. Those outcomes we experience now affirm our beliefs. So, yep, it turned out just like I thought it was going to. And now, so we have this affirmation, this this attaboy. That's exactly what should have happened, so therefore it did happen. And now the affirmed belief becomes our normal. What is normal becomes the status quo. And to deviate from that to the left or to the right, above or below, is to create conflict where? Inside. Inside. It's the comfort zone that our brain is constantly trying to keep us in. So a comfort zone is really just a limited area of perception and association. It is that space where we are supposed to be. And I use the term supposed to be very, very loosely. The comfort zone is an invisible bubble we create in our mind for ourselves because we feel safe there. We feel that we belong there. Well, I'm not good enough to be a multimillionaire, so it's okay, though, if I make 50000 a year. So I'm going to be really excited if I make 50000 a year. Maybe we feel like we deserve to be there because we failed in our life and we really had a tragic thing happen and, and we really messed up when we were 25 or 30 or 40. And so therefore, now that I'm in my 40s or my 50s, I don't deserve anything better than this. So this now becomes the place that I must stay. A really great way to, to envision this whole idea of a comfort zone is a thermostat. Those of us who uh, have central heat and air, we have thermostats on our walls, and and those thermostats are designed in such a way to regulate a temperature to a set point. And so let's say that you set the thermostat to 70 degrees, and if the temperature rises above 70 degrees, there is an electrical impulse that is sent to the cooling mechanism, turns on the air conditioning, and drops the temperature back down toward what was normal. You set normal at 70. Conversely, if the temperature drops below 70, an impulse is sent to that unit. It turns off the AC, the air conditioning, or if it's set in the heat mode, it would flip the heater on in order to regulate the temperature back to, again, the setting, the norm, the pre-programmed point that is acceptable. Now, this could be terribly inefficient because, you know, it could be always turning off, turning on, turning off, turning on, turning what have you. But in climate control, this is what's powerful. Hear this. In the climate control world, they created what's called a dead space of about two degrees on either side of the setting. So if, if 70 degrees is the point that you set the thermostat on, 
then between 68 degrees and 72 degrees is the what they call, they literally refer to it as the comfort zone that you have set. And so anything in that window is considered acceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I function the exact same way. We have something that we believe to be normal. Our belief, our mind is that this is normal. And if we get too far above that, something clicks in our mind and it begins to regulate us back down to where we're supposed to be. If we fall even below that, substandard to that, then something kicks in and we want to make sure we stay in that window. But that is how comfort zones work. We are constantly determining within us what is normal and where we should be. The great Seth Godin says, discomfort brings engagement and change. Discomfort. We're trying to get out of comfort zones. Discomfort means you're doing something that others were unlikely to do because they're hiding out in the comfort zone. When you are uncomfortable, your uncomfortable actions lead to success. And then the organization or the mission that you were on rewards you and brings you back for even more. It's amazing how this works. So we're getting to the end here now, and I want to share with you what it means to create a new normal. So, man, what, how in the world do I bust out of this bubble, this shell? Well, the only way to create a new normal is to challenge the old one. You cannot continue to allow the limitation to dictate to you how far you can or will go in life. When you bump into that brick wall, into that setting, into that regulator, when you bump into that limiting belief, you have to challenge that belief. You have to deal with that belief. So I must reset the thermostat. I must reset the regulator, which is my beliefs, by the way. I have to raise the standard to which I will regulate. I don't want to be at 70 degrees in my life anymore. I want to go to 80 degrees. I want to bump this thing up 10 digits right now. And so I have to reset that. I must dismantle the previous comfort zones by intentionally addressing the beliefs, the mindsets, the fears, all the things holding me in place. So the comfort zone has been my acceptable order. That's right for me. It's good for me to be right here. But And anything happening outside of that order or that normal, of course, creates conflict. So how do I change it? Well, to change it, I must force myself to redefine what normal is by first creating an out-of-order state. You say, what? That's right. It's out of order. I, I, I literally, intentionally throw things out of order. I introduce thoughts, beliefs about who I am, where I'm going, what I'm going to accomplish, that right now in my heart, I don't even believe them, but I begin to reprogram my mind and challenge those limiting beliefs to create conflict so that I can move into a new order. Watch this. It is discrepancy production that creates ultimately discrepancy reduction. The more I produce discrepancy between where I am and where I want to be, the closer I move toward where I want to be and that discrepancy, that gap begins to close. So I have to challenge the regulator by creating a new target. So now I want to give you seven steps to a transformed mind. Seven steps to a transformed mind. And let me tell you what, I have an entire series that I've done on this subject called The Battle for the Mind. I have a second series that I did, a follow-up series to that called Transforming the Mind. And I'll have links to those in the show notes. Not trying to sell you a product, but if you want to really dig into this topic and really go through a process that I believe would really help you, uh, then you might want to avail yourself of those resources. But seven steps to a transformed mind. Number one, ask questions. Get in a place where you can look at yourself in the mirror and be honest with yourself. If it helps you get someone else that you trust, that knows you, that believes in you, get them to help you to see yourself in a more objective way. And here are the questions I want you to ask. Number one, ask questions. Here they are. What are my comfort zones? Which ones are keeping me safe? 
which ones are actually holding me back? See, it's not bad to have some safe places, but if they're holding me back from forward progress, I need to know what those are. Which comfort zone areas do I need to expand in order to arrive at the fulfillment of what God has created me to be, given me to do, and what he believes to be true about my life? And what mindsets or beliefs must be addressed to accomplish this? What beliefs have I held on to and allowed to govern my life that I've got to go after those? I've got to dismantle those beliefs and get to a place where I introduce new beliefs. What does God know to be true about this? Number one, ask questions. Number two, through that process, identify faulty and limiting beliefs, faulty and limiting mindsets. Write them down. Here's how you do that. Well, you look at the fruit of your life in a particular area, and if the fruit does not look like what you really, really want to be or feel as though you're being directed to go after, if it really doesn't look like your wishes, your desires, and your dreams, if the fruit of your life presently doesn't look like that, that dream, then I've got to ask myself the question, what limiting mindsets, what faulty beliefs are present? And I have to write those down. I have to identify those, and I have to own those. Ask questions and identify faulty and limiting beliefs. Number three, I have to be intentional about taking thoughts captive. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Gird up the loins of your mind. Paul said, I must take every thought captive. Make it a prisoner. Arrest it. Do not entertain it. Do not allow it free uh, roaming around in my mind. I have to take captive every thought, and I have to make that thought subject to the knowledge of God concerning my life. So I cannot afford to be passive in my process of achieving a transformed mind. I cannot just say, well, whatever happens, happens. No, I have to be aggressive, I have to be intentional, and I have to be totally diligent that when a thought comes in my mind that is counterintuitive or counterproductive to where I'm wanting to go, I have to arrest that. I have to grab that thought by the throat, and I have to make it conform to what is actually true. Number four, I have to control my self-talk. I'm going to talk about this in another episode, but words are very, very powerful. We, we really don't understand sometimes how we curse ourselves and how we set things in motion because we say things, by the way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you believe to be true in your heart, you're going to say it in one way or the other. And Sometimes our mouth is the way we become aware of what our heart believes. Sometimes we hear ourselves say something, and as that that thing comes out of our mouth, we're like, oh, man, gosh, that came from somewhere down inside there. i got to figure out why why do I believe that? And so we we have to grab a hold of our tongue. The Bible says the tongue is the rudder of life. Matter of fact, the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And again, we're going to talk a lot more about that in another episode. But you have to control your words, control your self-talk. Do not affirm limiting beliefs. In fact, we're going to tell you in a minute how to affirm the truth. So control self-talk. Number five, I want to encourage you, especially if you're a Christian or a believer, go to the Word of God. Look at what the Bible says about you. You know, you don't even have to have a direct quote-unquote word from God or some prophet to speak to you. There are so many things that are principles in the Word of God concerning your worth, your value, your future, your destiny, your identity, your life, all those things. And sometimes you can just go right there to that beautiful book and extract from there tremendous promises and affirmations concerning who you are and what you can do. And so I encourage you, examine the Word of God. Reflect and remember what God has spoken to you or about you. Number six, create summarized affirmation statements or confession statements. You can use what you find in the scriptures. You can can write out uh, replacement beliefs, uh, these limiting beliefs you've identified. Write a totally opposite statement to that. Uh, Literally create the antidote to the very thing that has been destroying you and keeping you from making progress. So create affirmation statements or confession statements that replace limiting beliefs 
and they begin to stretch or expand your comfort zone concerning every area of your life. Write out these statements. And then, number seven, develop and engage the habit of reading, affirming, confessing these statements that you have written down. I encourage you to make them first person. Make them present tense. Don't say, I'm going to be a successful author. I am a successful author. Don't say, I'm going to be financially independent someday. That sounds good, but that's not, that's not accurate. That's not right. If God has said you are those things, just say, I am, because there is no time with him anyway. So you, you make these first person, you make them present tense, and you speak them as though they've already happened. I am. I am. And you develop this daily habit. Several times a day, grab those index cards, or if you have an iPad or an iPhone that you've typed them in, whatever the case may be, get those things out, man, and just out loud, I am, I am, I am, I have, I have, I have accomplished, I am. And you state them, and you begin to literally cause your mind to be reprogrammed. This is how you break out of the status quo and reprogram your mind in a very powerful way. I'm going to wrap it up by sharing a couple of things with you. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Confession, confessing things about your future is great, but you have to believe what you're confessing. I'm calling on you and I'm challenging you to go after dismantling the status quo. You don't want to be normal. Challenge the status quo. Create a new normal for yourself. Redefine what is acceptable and good enough. Well, it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm making a good living. I flip a good living. My Bible tells me that he has given us the power to create wealth. So making a living, I was never called to make a living. I was actually created to create wealth. And so redefine in your mind, in your mind, what is acceptable and good enough for you, for your family, for your grandchildren for your great-grandchildren. Get in the habit of saying, I am, and then filling in the blank. Get in the habit of saying out loud, I am, and filling in the blank. And lastly, I want to share this with you. Change your mind. You will change your world. Well, if you'd like to comment on this episode, please go to brianholmes.com forward slash zero one two. And go to the show notes for the episode and scroll down to the comment section. I would so love to hear from you. I'd love to uh, see your comments. Certainly would love to take and engage with you in questions or whatever conversation you would like to have on this subject or any of the others that we've presented to you so far. Well, next week, we're going to be right back here. My hope is that I believe I'm going to have a very special guest for you on an interview, and you will not want to miss this. We're going to continue in this conversation about the heart, about the mind, and about our thinking as it relates to our kingdom walk with God and our potential being fully realized. So if you'd like to leave a question for us on our voicemail line, just go to brianholmes.com and right there on the right-hand side of every page, you will see a little icon that says, leave your message here, and we would love very much for you to do that. Well, I'm going to be attending the SCORE conference here in just a week or two, and I'm very excited to be with Michael Hyatt, Ken Davis, and all of that wonderful tribe. And uh, if you're still on the fence, I believe there are still a few slots open for the SCORE conference, and that is a conference for speakers, for communicators, for those that have a message they want to present. And I would strongly encourage you Uh, If you're going to go to a meeting that's going to train you and equip you to be a better leader, a better speaker, then just pick the best ones. And I'm telling you, the SCORE Conference with Michael Hyatt, everything these guys do, just so top shelf. And I am personally excited that I will be participating as a student, as a learner, and I'm just ready to engage the process. If you happen to go to scoreconference.tv, scoreconference.tv, that's S-C-O-R-R-E, conference.tv, and you do decide to attend the conference, I would love to see you there. And be sure to use the discount code HOLMES, H-O-L-M-E-S, and you'll receive $100 off. Also going to be attending the Platform Conference again in November with Michael and with Ken. 
and uh, Cliff Ravenscraft and uh, Ray Edwards and just a whole lot of great leaders, great thought leaders. And uh, if you want to really take your business, if you want to take your message, take your product to the next level, I encourage you to go to platformconference.tv and really take a long look at what this conference offers you by way of building your business, building your brand, building your platform. Again, the discount code HOMES uh, will get you $100 off of that conference as well. I would so love, that one's in Dallas, by the way, my hometown. So I would love to have you in my hometown visiting with us there. I have a couple of openings still for coaching clients. If you are looking for a a personal coach, an executive coach, a coach to help you launch that business idea, or whatever the case may be, whatever uh, you are facing now where you are wanting to take your life to the next level, I would be so honored, and I really believe we could be effective at helping you to achieve just that as your personal coach. If you would contact us at brianholmes.com or call our offices, I'd love to personally speak with you about the possibility of being your coach. If you would like to have me speak at your church, your conference, your event, uh, leadership seminar, or any other type of venue, please visit our speaking page, brianholmes.com forward slash speaking, and we would be happy to discuss that with you as well. Lastly, I want to just share with you a couple of thoughts. Subscribe to our updates. This is something we're providing to you free. There's no obligation, no any, no ties whatsoever, other than we want to keep you informed as to what we're producing and putting out there. You can subscribe to the updates at brianholmes.com. We'd love to give you a free gift for signing up for those weekly emails. Also, subscribe to this podcast in iTunes. And i just tell you right now, I would love it so much. I'd appreciate it. If you find value in the Strategic Living Podcast, if you would be so kind as to give us a five-star rating, if you feel like we deserve that, that helps us to be recognizable, to be noticed, to be elevated in the rankings so we're very visible on iTunes. And that would be great. If you'd like to leave a review there, a written review, uh, we'd encourage you to submit that as well. Share this with your friends. Listen, the only way we get the word out, the only way we have people knowing what we are providing here is if you, our listener right now, will help us by sharing this on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, uh, any other social media outlet that you are engaged on, whatever communities you live in, we would love for you to help us get the word out about this. Well, I trust that something we've shared today has challenged you to really pursue God's very best for your life. My desire, truly, is that whatever is in your past, that you really can walk away from that and leave it in your past. We want to see you healed. We want to see your mind transformed, your heart really renewed. And ultimately, once that process has taken place, we want to see you activated to fulfill your unique purpose, your unique God-given destiny. We truly love you. Well, until next time, we just want to again say thank you for being on the program. And what a great joy it is just to hang out with you each week and share our heart, share our ideas. Remember, next week, we're hoping to have a very special guest. I'm not going to say who in case something were to happen, but be here on the program. Be sure to subscribe so you can get automatic downloads of every week's podcast. Until next time, remember this. You are made in His image, designed for a purpose, and you are truly destined for greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, ma'am, sir, the world is waiting for the real you to show up. We love you. We believe in you. We expect great things from you. Until next time, God bless. We'll see you back here next week.